Turn with me to Mark chapter 2 in your Bibles, Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. And if you don't have your Bible with you, there's Bibles under the seats in front of you, Bibles in the back as well. And you can take one of those home if you don't have a Bible that's easy for you to read. Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12. We're going to dive into this passage from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this passage offers us a profound insight into human condition, deepest needs, the story of the paralyzed man here being lowered through the roof to be healed by Jesus is not just a miraculous event, but it is a profound lesson about the priority of forgiveness, the priority of forgiveness over physical healing. J.I. Packer once said, Forgiveness is the divine act of God in which He releases us from the guilt and penalty of our sin. Forgiveness is the divine act of God in which He releases us from the guilt and penalty of our sin. And that is where we're going to go with this today. And we're going to see that our greatest need is not physical healing, but it's the forgiveness of sins. Mark 2, verses 1 through 4, let's set the scene here. And when he came back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door. <clears throat> and he was speaking the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And being unable to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof over where he was. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the mat where the paralytic was laying. Now, hospitality, one of the basic laws of the area over there in that time frame, the people of Capernaum did not wait for an invitation, but simply came to your house. I actually think that'd be kind of fun. Hey, be over there in a few minutes, but I'm not going to tell you. They came to this house in droves, and that meant that some of the truly needy people uh, that uh, they couldn't get close enough to Jesus to receive help, uh, but these four friends of this man decided to lower their friend through the roof, trusting that Jesus would heal him, and Jesus did, and the miracle of healing gave obviously, Jesus, the opportunity to teach this lesson about forgiveness. So that's setting the scene for us there. And in verses 3 through 5, as we look at it again, they came bringing to him this paralytic carried by four men, unable to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. They, they removed the roof over where he was, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the mat where the paralytic was lying. So these four men struggling with this mat, with this, as one uh, version says, couch, on which lay a paralytic, motionless, approached the, the fringe of this impossible crowd, and their attempts to get through this uh, wasn't going to work. They, they rested the mat and probably mopped the preparation, uh, perspiration, sorry, as they glanced from this thin, worn face of their friend to this crowd, they probably conferred with each other. All right, what's the next step? The roof. We're going we're gonna to go through the roof. There was possibly a stairway leading to the roof. Some of the homes had that in that time frame. Uh, maybe... Perhaps they ascended the neighbor's roof and stepped across because the houses were close enough to do that. Whatever the case, the, after hauling and pushing, they had their friend up on this roof and they rested long enough to catch their breath, probably, and they did an amazing thing. They started to tear a hole in this person's house. Now, the typical Syrian 
roof was constructed of, of timbers that laid parallel to each other, about two to three feet apart. Then crosswise were, were thinner timber sticks that were laid closer to each other, thus forming the basic roof. And upon that, they would put reeds and branches of trees and thistles. And then over that, they would put about a foot of dirt. And then they would pack it down, get a little moist, pack it down, get a little moist, pack it down. All told, the typical roof was about two feet thick. Okay, And during the spring, they were green. They were hobbit holes. They were grass on top of these roofs. They probably were beautiful. And these men are digging through this thing. And so you can now imagine on the inside, the house hears this digging and pounding against the loud conversation as the men are digging away the dirt. They tear away the branches. They pry the roofing loose between the beams. Debris are starting to fall. I mean, it's dirt. It's branches and things like that on the people in the house. And then there's a crack of light. A crack of light. Then a, uh, we can be sure that there are probably some shouts some shouts of like, what is going on here? What is going on here? And there were probably shouts between the people inside and the people on the roof. And then there was probably this final warning from above. Look out below. And there's this bed on ropes. So above with the light streaming from dusty beams, four sweaty, determined faces. Below, Pharisees, scribes, shaking dirt off their robes, and in the midst of all of this, the Prince of Peace. And now, the paralytic. Now, history knows this very well as the Capernaum caper. And if you've been to Sunday school as a kid at all, this is one of the favorite stories to share. But let's concentrate just a little bit on a few different groups over the next few moments here. First, let's concentrate on these four friends. They really loved this guy. They would not put all of this effort in if they didn't. They wouldn't vandalize another property to achieve this end. They ignored probably the, the protests and judgments of those around them. Perhaps he was family, we don't know. Maybe he was simply a neighbor whom they had grown up with and played together. Whatever the relationship, they cared for this man. And whatever happened that day, healing, rejection, whatever, the paralytic was actually a very rich man. He had something for which some people spend millions of dollars and yet never find. He had four guys that cared about him, that were going to do whatever they could to get him in front of the person they thought could solve a problem. And God worked through this man's life because his friends cared. God is pleased to work through those who love him, who then love others and bring others to him. Yeah, and these friends also had faith. There is no way they could have thought of going to all of this outrageous extreme of action if they did not actually believe that Christ could and would heal their friend. Why in the world would they go through all of that with a, eh, 
Maybe. You see, a wavering faith would have gone, yeah, I don't think I'm going to hoist the stretcher on the roof, uh, and I'm certainly going to bolt before I have to look at someone because I dug into their roof. Can you imagine if, if you really weren't in on this as a friend, a true friend? You probably would have gone, hey guys, this is embarrassing. I'm tapping out. You have to finish it yourself. But these four believed. And I just, I just need to tell you when, you, when you look at the Scripture, it makes you understand the kind of faith that invites God's power to move. And it take, it, it, this teaches us about the faith which makes the Lord's power so great. D.A. Carson says this, the faith of the friends who lowered the paralytic through the roof is portrayed as a remarkable demonstration of perseverance and trust. Their actions not only show their own faith, but also become a means through which the paralytic man encounters Jesus' grace and healing. See, their faith was persistent. There's no stopping them. There was no, well, the door's closed, we're done. They didn't leave it to a committee. They got going. And Jesus praised this type of action saying, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcibly advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. Forceful men lay hold of it. Those who really want something spiritually, go for it. When the four tore through the roof, they took the kingdom by a violent, determined force. And that unleashes God's power in so many ways. And I love the fact that their faith was creative. Undoubtedly, some were standing there seeing the success of these four, and saying the famous, famous sentence, why didn't we think about that? Well, the answer is, is they did not have the faith that allowed them to passionately move in a creative way as these four. A faith which truly believes in Christ will end up being inventive, will end up working in ways that God leads, that people go, wow, I'm constantly reminded of the genius behind the radio station HCJB, which sits smack dab on the equator at 10,000 feet on top of a mountain and broadcasts the gospel out by radio, and because of where they creatively figured out where to put that radio station many years ago, many, many years ago, they broadcast the gospel to virtually everywhere on the globe, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And it's the creativity of God's people that have things like that happen all of the time. A driving belief that Christ is the only hope for the world. Believing faith finds a way. Whether in your home, your workplace, your neighborhood, or the whole world. And you know what? Their faith was sacrificial. Someone would have to pay to fix the roof. And that would take time. That would take labor. 
that would take expense. But guess what? I guarantee you those four guys were totally okay with that. A faith that brings Christ's power to the world is willing to pay the price to do that. And in this, then, we move from the friends to the forgiveness. We move from the faith of the friends to the priority of forgiveness back into verse 5. And Jesus, seeing what? Their faith. Said to the paralytic child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Aha! So once again, the picture, Jesus, impressed by their faith, said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Now, that seems to be a strange thing to say. If it was a question of paralysis, not sin, why would he do that? But Jesus went beyond the symptoms to the cause. He would not heal the body and neglect the soul. He would not remedy a temporary situation, a temporal condition, and leave an eternal condition untouched. So he said, because of faith, your sins are forgiven. It was a wonderful announcement. This man's sins were forgiven. He didn't have to wait till the day of judgment to hear that. He had the present assurance of forgiveness. And what's also really neat about this, everyone, so do all of us who put our faith in the Lord Jesus. We have the present assurance of forgiveness. Believe unto me and you will be saved. Now the scribes, the Pharisees, they they caught on very quickly to the significance of the statement. They were very well trained, obviously, in biblical doctrine to know that only God can forgive sins. Anyone who professed to forgive sins was therefore claiming to be God, and that logic is correct. The opponents of Jesus, though, did not consider the alternative thought in the room. They did not consider that Jesus is indeed a member of the triune God, as suggested in many texts in the Old Testament. I mean, just off the top of my head, I think of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. And instead of acknowledging the Lord Jesus to be God, they accuse Him in their hearts of speaking blasphemy. And that leads us into what Jesus then says immediately in verse 8. Jesus, aware in His spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, now see, at this point we're already thinking, hey, this guy is probably also healed. No, his sins were forgiven. He still couldn't move. He said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go to your home. And he got up immediately picked up the mat, and went out before everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. You know, I think I would have said the same thing. And what we see here is to address the skepticism of the teachers of the law, Jesus poses a question. What is easier to say to this paralyzed guy? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, and take your mat and walk. 
And this rhetorical question highlights the difference between the visible and the invisible. It's easier to say something that has no immediate evidence, actually like saying, hey, your sins are forgiven. Well, none of us can see that than to perform a physical miracle that can be seen and verified. So what does Jesus do? I will do both to prove that I can do the one that you can't see. The healing is a visible sign of the invisible reality of forgiveness. John Stott says, the miracle of healing here is not merely a display of Jesus' power, but a tangible expression of the deeper reality of forgiveness. The physical healing serves as a visible confirmation of the invisible, but equally real forgiveness of sin. And what this miracle does is it confirms Jesus' divine authority and the truth of His words. His physical miracle verifies His moral miracle. It, and it kind of was like, okay, so what do... You, you go, what, what do the Pharisees say? Probably nothing. Thus the reason it's not there. They really, it's like, ah, uh, this is, we got to figure this one out. But it tells you the response of the crowd, doesn't it? And he got up and immediately picked up the mat and went out before everyone in verse 12, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. In verse 13, as we end this section here, and he went out again by the seashore, and the entire crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. It's kind of like this lightning in the room. He got up, he took out his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. Obviously, everyone is amazed. They're praising God. We've not seen anything like this. It is an incredible moment illustrated by the paralytic, probably with the light of what was up above from the hole in the ceiling. And I'm, I'm just guessing that he didn't just get up and go, awesome, and walked out. There's probably as Scripture says, leaping and dancing and praising God. Could you imagine his four friends at this moment? They're up above. Because there's no way to get in, so they just miraculously all of a sudden end up down below. So they're seeing this all from above, and this healing happens, their friend pops up, and you got to know that these guys are up there going, yeah, high fives. I don't know if they did that 2,000 years ago. The, the crowd was amazed. The Pharisees and the scribes were not having fun. Spurgeon, when preaching on this, section of scripture said, I think I see him. He sets one foot down to God's glory. He plants the other to the same note. He walks to God's glory. He carries his bed to God's glory. He moves his whole body to the glory of God. He speaks, he shouts, he sings, he leaps to the glory of God. What a display. And who is to say that the paralytic and his four friends did not dance down the street with a boatload of people behind him cheering? And as he went home, he bore something far more impressive than that bed. It was a clean heart. 
Jesus did to him what David's cry was in the song that we sang earlier. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And that's what he got. The greatest miracle of all. No guilt, no bitterness. You know, someday for him, those restored limbs would wither again. But there would remain in him a clean heart. A water springing up for everlasting life. His sins were forgiven. The Lord can do anything He wants. Amen? He can heal any disease He pleases. But the greatest miracle, the one that is eternal, is that He forgives sin. And has He ever said to you, child, your sins are forgiven? See, Luke says of this event, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. And that power was unleashed by the love and the faith of four friends. And this is how it also was unleashed today in a world that is literally paralyzed in sin. We must love the world, not love what the world does, not love what the world is guilty of, not even participate in any of that. We're called to remove ourselves from that. But we love those that we can see. Our family members, our neighbors, our colleagues at work, and extend the love of Christ to them, and including those we cannot see. Determine to love those in Christ in your circle of influence. Would you be like those four guys and doing whatever you can to get someone in front of Jesus? You see, what really happens then is that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the one who can heal. It's, it's simply a matter of believing Jesus' own words. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you, without any qualifications, believe that? And if you do, you're going to end up being persistent, you're going to end up being creative, and you're going to end up being sacrificial in bringing people to the Lord. You see, they brought them, him to the Lord. But Jesus saves. And so how do we respond to all of this real briefly here as we wrap up? Well, first of all, we need to receive what the paralytic received. We need to receive it. Just as the paralytic man received both physical healing and forgiveness, we must first receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers. It is a gift, and we must accept it with faith and gratitude, and it changes everything. And then we live in it. Forgiveness is not a one-time event, but a way of life. We are called to live in the reality of God's forgiveness, letting it shape our attitudes, our actions, everything that we are. This means living in a way that reflects the grace and mercy we have received. Glorifying God, as it says there in verse 12. So we receive this grace, we live in it, we receive this forgiveness, we live in this forgiveness, and we extend this forgiveness. We are called to forgive, and this should overflow into our relationships, enable us to forgive those who have wronged us. And that's why Paul says in Colossians 3, so as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, 
and patience, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you.